Hello, my name is Kate Chesterman. I'm a GP in South Norfolk, and I also co-host the GP Notebook Education Study Groups. Welcome to GP Notebook Podcasts, where we present bite-sized topics aimed at all those working in primary care. You can find us on all major podcast channels, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at GP Notebook, or you can follow me personally at Chesterman Kate for more information about our new podcasts and study groups as they become available. Please do visit gpnotebookpodcast.com for show notes, references and resources for all our podcasts. Finally, you can also visit gpnotebookeducation.com to learn more about our upcoming GP Notebook study groups and download free resources such as our series of shortcuts. So let's start this podcast with a case that we might come across in primary care. Mary is a 78-year-old lady who is usually very active and independent. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis, but this has been well controlled with methotrexate. Mary was admitted to hospital three months ago by her GP because she was delirious, hallucinating and very unsteady on her feet. She was pyrexial and tachycardic. The GP admitted her urgently due to concerns about sepsis and on admission she was indeed treated for sepsis secondary to a urinary tract infection. Mary was an inpatient for three weeks. She had a short stay in intensive care due to problems maintaining her blood pressure and she also required intravenous antibiotics and fluids. So this had all occurred three months ago but Mary has made an appointment to see you now and she explains that when she was discharged they had told her that she was fully recovered from her urine infection and could go home. However, Mary thought that since discharge she was more forgetful and she also felt that her mobility had not fully recovered and she really only felt confident walking with a stick. And remember, this is a lady who was previously completely independent and very active. She was worried that she still had a lingering infection. So you listened to her concerns, you examined her and you found that her observations were now all normal, her urine dip was negative and you repeated some blood tests which were reassuringly in the normal range. So what is going on with Mary? So today I'm going to talk about post-sepsis syndrome, which is an important but unfortunately still poorly understood condition. And it's diagnosed when patients are found to be suffering with persistent physical, medical, cognitive or psychological issues after sepsis. We don't fully understand why this condition develops, but it's thought that it's probably a result of changes in the microcirculation and the influence of pro-inflammatory cytokines during sepsis that cause the lasting damage. And it can affect anyone who has suffered from sepsis, whatever their age. And although it is more common in the elderly, it can also affect children. It occurs more frequently in those who are severely ill and who had required ICU admission, but it can occur even in those whose management was ward-based. It is thought that around one in six survivors of sepsis have severe and persistent impairments. And when we think that there are over 200,000 episodes of sepsis a year in the UK, then there are presumably a lot of patients out there suffering with the long-term consequences. Now, as I've already alluded to, post-sepsis syndrome doesn't just describe one or two symptoms, but it can encompass a wide range of symptomatology. And we saw this with our case study, Mary, who was struggling with poor mobility, a decline in her memory and loss of confidence. So what other symptoms might indicate a diagnosis of post-sepsis syndrome? Well, cognitive issues are not uncommon and can include poor concentration and attention, a decline in short-term memory and slower processing speeds. And these symptoms can persist for several years. Those who suffered with delirium during the initial sepsis are more likely to be affected by cognitive issues post-sepsis 
and this is probably due to the cerebral inflammation and ischemia, which is implicated in the development of delirium. Sepsis can also have significant implications for a patient's ongoing mental health, including depression and anxiety, PTSD and sleep disturbance. And survivors also have an increased risk of physical health problems, including cardiovascular and kidney disease, and they may also experience lethargy, shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, joint pain, hair loss, changes in taste or vision, and the list goes on. One really important factor to note is the increased risk of recurring or new infections in this cohort of patients. Interestingly, immunosuppression, which is often seen in early sepsis, can persist for quite some time. There was a study that showed that one in five ICU sepsis survivors still had positive blood cultures up to 150 days later, suggesting an ongoing difficulty in clearing infections. And recurrent sepsis can be a problem for years after discharge, with studies showing that sepsis survivors are at increased risk of further episodes for up to eight years. And as well as being physically draining to be getting repeated infections while trying to recover from sepsis, it is also understandably hugely anxiety-provoking. Nearly a third of those discharged after sepsis were readmitted within three months, and nearly a third of these readmissions were due to recurrent sepsis, with other causes including renal failure, pneumonia and heart failure. So the fear of further infections and admissions is a very real and understandable one. So patients are affected in very different ways and to different degrees, but it is clear that the long-term effects of sepsis in some patients result in increased rehospitalization, increased mortality and a decreased quality of life. It usually takes around 6 to 18 months to recover from the majority of post-sepsis syndrome symptoms. But as we have already seen, for some symptoms and some patients, particularly in the elderly, the ongoing effects of their episode of sepsis may be much more prolonged. And some people sadly may never get back to their pre-infection abilities. And these symptoms can have huge implications for the patient's day-to-day lives. It, It can impact their ability to work, to drive, to maintain relationships and to live independently. Now a lot of patients, like Mary, may be discharged with little information about what to expect during their recovery. There is often little in the way of hospital follow-up post-sepsis and that, along with the vague nature of a lot of these symptoms, means that these patients are likely to present to us in primary care. So what can we do? Well, unfortunately, there is little research in how to optimise the health of patients post-sepsis. But I think as we always strive to do, listening to our patients' concerns and assessing them thoroughly is an important first step. But then being aware of this condition and being able to explain it to our patients is likely to bring some understanding and reassurance. We need to assess the symptoms and risks and treat them appropriately Because with such a wide range of potential symptoms, we obviously won't be treating every patient in the same way. But it would be worth considering factors such as optimising cardiovascular risks, given the increased chance of cardiovascular disease post-sepsis. We should be alert to future infections and treat them promptly, as well as making sure our patients are up to date with their vaccinations. We also need to be watchful for the emergence of mental health issues and consider the involvement of mental health workers and referring for cognitive behavioural therapy if appropriate. And we may need to involve other professionals. Physiotherapists can be invaluable to maximise physical functioning and increasing confidence. And we might also want to consider input from voluntary organisations. One of the organisations that I wanted to highlight is the UK Sepsis Trust, who offer phone and email support to those recovering from sepsis and their loved ones, as well as those who have suffered a bereavement because of sepsis. I've put a link to their website in the show notes for this podcast, 
And I'd encourage you to take a look because as well as support for patients, there are some really good professional resources, such as their sepsis screening tools and some really informative videos. So I just wanted to leave you with a last thought. Sepsis is more common than heart attacks. But for those who are recovering from an acute myocardial infarction, there is often excellent follow-up and aftercare with access to resources such as psychological support and cardiac rehab. And this is all absolutely appropriate as we are all aware of the ongoing health concerns in these patients. But maybe we ought to start thinking about the recovery from sepsis in a similar way and remember that this acute illness also has long-term implications. Because I think what has become clear as we become increasingly aware of the long-term effects of sepsis is that patients may not have fully recovered just because they are fit for discharge. Thank you for listening and I hope that this has been helpful. Please feel free to get in touch via social media or email me at kchesterman at gpnotebook.com if you have any questions, comments or ideas for future podcasts.